everybody. My name is Christine Kim, and uh, thank you uh, for the nice introduction um, to the BRIC um, Associated uh, Personnel. Today, I'd like to talk about how glutamine metabolism regulates the longevity of hair follicle stem cells. Before moving in, I'd like to introduce a little bit about adult stem cells. They are very important in the maintaining of the tissues. So in the various uh, type of tissues, we will be able to find a different type of stem cells. They are usually undifferentiated and their role is mostly to replenish dying or damaged cells. Because these are their roles and characteristics, there are two properties that, that are very important when it comes to adult stem cells. And those two properties are the first, self-renewal ability. So the self-renewal uh, ability is important because it can provide a reservoir um, of stem cells in case they need to produce uh, another round of differentiating cells. And of course, the other property that is very important is differentiating ability. So stem cells should be able to produce different type of subsets of, um, of different type of cells. Since I am interested in um, adult stem cells, central question that I would like to address is how is adult stem cell plasticity regulated? In order to answer this question, I utilized hair follicle as a model. Um, hair follicle is a great model to study stem cell um, properties because it can self-regenerate at homeostatic environment. So throughout our lifetime, we go through rounds of growth phase. That's, um, that's when, you, when we grow actual hair and we go through regression after growth. Um, and, and then the hair follicle will rest until the next cue would come to them for another round of hair cycle. If you look into the growth phase, um, particularly stem cells get activated and um, they will produce, produce progenitor cells that will differentiate into different type of cells that they need to grow the hair. However, during the regression phase, a subset of progenitor cells will change their faith so that they will go back into stem cells um, faith. And then during the resting phase, stem cells will go into quiescence, so they will rest until the next cue would come um, for them to get activated for another round of growth. And the mouse, um, it, it is very convenient for us to study hair follicle because the first cycle is synchronized, so we can precisely follow through the first telogen, antigen, and keratogen until it goes into another round of telogen. And the morphology and markers are very well characterized, so we know exactly by um, uh, HNE staining um, exact uh, phases of hair follicle. And also we know a lot of um, markers that we can use for different type of cells. So using hair follicle, today I'd like to answer the question about how is hair follicle stem cell faith determined very conveniently, um, around the time when I started this project, there was an organoid model that was already developed that were able to culture hair follicle stem cells and their immediate progenitor cells. So here you can see that um, the outer bulge area is where hair follicle stem cells reside. And hair follicle stem cells are marked by CD34 positive, alpha 6 positive. Their immediate progenitors are um, outer root sheet cells marked in pink here, and they're, um, they are marked by um, CD34 negative and alpha-6 positive. So throughout my talk, I will refer hair follicle stem cells as 30, CD34 positive cells, and I will refer um, to progenitor cells as CD34 negative cells. So this, using the organoids, uh, we have already demonstrate, uh, demonstrated that uh, we are able to culture CD34 positive and negative cells. And also when we transplant um, stem cells cultured in organoid, we are able to um, grow hair in a nude mouse. So this has been uh, very well characterized and um, I utilize this organoid model to get, get a kickstart into the project. First thing that I did was to culture the organoid and using the marker that I already know, CD34 positive for hair follicle stem cells and CD34 negative 
for progenitor cells, and I sort it into pure population. And each population was sub subject to RNA sequencing. And when I did go term analysis, the top um, genes that were upregulated in progenitor cells were all related to mitochondrial respir respiration. You can see here that mitochondrial ATP synthesis coming up, oxidative phosphorylation coming up. So it was very clear that progenitor cells um, upregulate uh, mitochondrial activity as well as related ox oxphos activity. So if, you, if we look into what oxidative phosphorylation mechanism exactly look like, the, mostly uh, we, are, we, we know that through the feeding of glucose, we can run TCA cycle, also known as CRAP cycle. And this is very important because it allows um, electron transport chain to run that will produce ATP in the end at, uh, with the expense of oxygen. Now, so I wanted to see if um, these key metabolites, the level of, if, if the level of these key metabolites were different in progenitor cells and um, stem cells. So I subject, um, pure population, sorted um, pure population into uh, LCMS um, analysis. And what, we, what you see here is that all the key metabolites related to TCA cycle uh, were decreased in the case of hair follicle stem cells. So it indicated that somehow compared to progenitor cells, the stem cells um, utilize less um, TCA cycle. Now, there was no difference observed um, with gly um, glycolysis uh, metabolites, indicating perhaps it's not really the glucose that's important, but something else. Um, of course, LCMS analysis is very good, but it's, um, that method is a static method. It's not a dynamic method. So I wanted to um, approach the, the idea with, with more dynamic um, experimental assay. So in order to do that, I utilize seahorse a mitochondrial stress test. This is a dynamic test where I can utilize different inhibitors or activators to uh, inhibit um, electron transport chain um, to allow uh, measure the maximal respiration level as well as the reserved met, uh, amount of, of uh, respiration level. So when I uh, follow through uh, the seahorse assay on both progenitor cells and stem cells, uh, what you can see here is for progenitor cells, the basal respiration level was already high and um, the maximum respiration was also um, high compared to stem cells. On the other hand, similar to mitochondrial stress test, we also have glycolytic stress test. When I um, performed gly glycolytic stress test, there was no difference. So it seems like um, the major difference uh, was with the mitochondrial stress test relating to oxphos um, respiration. Since oxidative phosphorylation requires oxygen, I figured that if I lower the available oxygen level, perhaps that could um, promote hair follicle stem cells um, state. So what I did was I cultured um, hair, fo hair follicle stem cells and progenitor cells um, in 2% oxygen, which was way lower than the environmental oxygen level, which is 20%. And indeed, when I, when I used low oxygen tension, um, I was able to gain more of hair follicle stem cells. Now, I wanted to carefully trace um, if this was due to the faith change and not due to selective proliferation or selective cell death. So in order to do that, what I did was I marked all the hair follicle stem cells with GFP. So we know that at the starting point, if it has GFP signal, it's all stem cells. On the other hand, if, if they don't have GFP um, signal, that would be progenitor cells. And I culture this pure um, population marked by GFP for 14 days, and I ran on flow cytometry analysis. So as you can see here, from day zero to day 14, uh, when I culture the cells under 2% oxygen, a lot more of progenitor cells converted themselves into um, stem cells. On the other hand, as you can see here, when we started with 100% stem cell, 
much less uh, cells converted themselves in back, back into progenitor cells under 2%. So this indicated that under low oxygen tension, um, progenitor cells um, favor hair follicle stem cells faith and hair follicle stem cells favor remaining in hair follicle state. Now I introduced to you the um, CTA, TCA cycle and electron transport chain feeding through um, glucose. This is the most uh, mostly well characterized and studied pathway. However, there, there is another pathway that, that can feed into TCA cycle, which is glutamine. Um, the glutamine gets converted to glutamate through the enzyme glutaminase, and this can be inhibited by this chemical called CB838. Um, so in order to really carefully um, delineate exactly which pathway is important um, in the conversion of hair follicle stem cells, I utilized various um, inhibitors and looked at their effect in producing hair follicle stem cells. So first of all, I focused on glucose um, feeding pathway, which would be glycolysis leading through lactate. And also this pyruvate can feed into TCA cycle through acetyl-CoA. Um, but as I kind of expected, um, when I modulated um, glucose feeding um, pathway um, through different inhibitors, I was unable to see any difference. This means that um, glucose leading uh, feeding pathways were not um, the major pathway that um, was responsible for a hair follicle stem cell faith decision. On the other hand, what was very important and striking was that when I um, inhibited electron transport chain, um, I was able to increase the level of hair follicle stem cells. And also when I inhibited a glutaminase and um, in the end, this inhibitor here would block the feeding of TCA cycle ending up into TCA, um, yeah, TCA. So when I blocked here upstream of um, TCA cycle, I was also able to increase hair follicle stem cells. So this indicates that it's not really glucose, but it's glutamine that's playing a role in, T um, in regulating hair follicle stem cell. And another thing to remember is that somehow, um, Blocking electron transport chain is, is important, but it's not really the oxygen that's re, uh, that's that that is important in changing the hair follicle stem cell fate. Because here I culture these cells in under twenty percent, and I just inhibited the electron transport chain. So it seems like just blocking the pathway itself in re, and disregarding um, the oxygen concentration was enough to bring progenitor cells into hair follicle stem cells. And so um, I looked into the level of glutamine and glutamate using um, LCMS, and I um, indeed see the difference that there was decreased level of glutamine and glutamate in hair follicle stem cells. Now, because I was interested in this glutamine feeding pathway, I wanted to make sure that this is actually, the glutamine is actually what, what is important in feeding into TCA cycle. As I told you before, LCMS measure, measurement is um, static measurement, it's not dynamic. However, our met metabol metabolism is very dynamic and met metabolic pathway is also very dynamic. So um, in order to capture dynamic um, activity, uh, within the cells, what I decided to do was to use isotope uh, to d use isotopic label and trace glutamine. Um, and this assay is usually called 13C flux because the carbon is labeled, and we're looking at the fluxing um, downstream of glutamine. So here you can see that all five carbons um, compromising. Um, glutamine is labeled and we can trace this carbon to see where it ends up being at um, throughout TCA cycle. This graph is a little bit um, crowded, but what you really want to focus on is the fact that um, in the case of progenitor cell, that's the empty bar here, all the key TCA uh, metabolites in the case of progenitor cells um, in this empty, empty bar 
are increased when you compare them to um, stem cells, that's the colored bar here. So even from um, glutamate, you can see that there's an increased level um, of glutamate in progenitor cells, both in 20%, the orange um, bars, and 2%, that's the blue bar. So here you can see a massive increase. Here again, you see a massive increase, and the trend is um, very clear throughout, uh, regardless of oxygen tension. So this indicates that it is indeed glutamine converting into glutamate feeding into TCA cycle that is very important in the conversion of progenitor cells into stem cells. And so what I decided to do next is the sense glutamate um, ends up being converted into alpha ketoglutarate that is part of TCA cycle. What if we were to feed in alpha ketoglutarate in 2% oxygen? Would that be enough to maintain progenitor cells since progenitor cells require TCA cycle? And that's exactly what you see here. So even when we culture cells in 2% um, 2% oxygen, um, and uh, when we feed um, TCA cycle um, with alpha ketoglutarates, you can see that um, progenitor stem cells faith was maintained comparably to 20% um, culture. So um, I want to pause here and to summarize a little bit of what we talked about so far. So, um, so far I have um, demonstrated that low oxygen tension promotes hair follicle, hair follicle stem cell state. What is important here to notice is that hair follicle stem cells are metabolically flexible. Uh, what I mean by here is that when they have oxygen and they're able to run TCA cycle and electron transport chain, they would do so. Um, to maintain their um, state. However, uh, when progenitor cells um, are limited um, to run TCA cycle and um, electron transport chain, they are unable to maintain their state, um, indicating that they strictly require glutaminolysis driven oxyphosphorylation. Um, when we use different type of inhibitors um, in the slides before I showed you, hair follicle stem cells, in, in no case, hair follicle stem cells were decreased. They were able to maintain their level no matter what, indicating that hair follicle stem cells are metabolically flexible. They would use whatever it takes to maintain their status. Now, the next question I wanted to address was which molecular player mediates this hair follicle stem cell faith determining glutaminolysis? In order to answer this question, I went back to the RNA sequencing and I looked at the top upstream regulator um, to get some idea on what would be the potential um, molecular player. And interestingly, what I saw was the RICTOR. So RICTOR um, is a uh, complex that, that's part of mTOR2. So mTOR2 is this complex um, mostly known for its binding of RICTOR. And this mTOR2 complex is known um, to activate a KT signaling pathway or a PKC signaling pathway. And each pathway is known to uh, be associated with cytoskeletal remodeling or cell survival and glucose metabolism. Um, now, mTOR2 is less studied compared to mTOR1, uh, that is more uh, well known. So it was a little bit um, interesting and also um, new and novel to look into mTOR2. Thankfully, I was able to obtain uh, RICTOR knockout mice. So I utilize this Victor EKO epithelial specific knockout um, using um, K5 Cree. Um, and I um, subject these two cells into 20% oxygen and 2% oxygen organoid development. And what you can see here is in the case of Victor, um, less stem cells were produced in the in, in organoids both in 20% oxygen and 
2% oxygen, indicating perhaps that mTOR2 is required for progenitor cells to convert their faith uh, into hair follicle stem cells. If you remember, um, this is just a snapshot of um, hair follicle stem cells. Um, I, I discussed about this in this previous slide. So in order to carefully um, follow um, how, how, how many cells, the percentage of cells convert from hair follicle stem cells to progenitor cells or progenitor cells into hair follicle stem cells, I started with pure population and looked at the ratio of um, the conversion rates from hair follicle stem cells to progenitors and progenitor cells into um, hair follicle stem cells. Interestingly, um, in the Rictor knockout mice, uh, conversion from hair follicle stem cells to progenitor cells, there were no difference. The level was somewhat uh, similar. However, strikingly, strikingly um, when you looked at here, uh, Rictor, when the Rictor knockout mice was cultured, they were unable to produce hair follicle stem cells when compared to control. So this was another uh, data that confirmed that mTOR2 is required for progenitors to convert their faith into hair follicle stem cells. Now, I told you that mTOR2 uh, can activate AKT signaling for cell pro proliferation. Since stem cells property is mostly associated with their ability to proliferate, I looked into AKT signaling pathway. And um, when I use AKT inhibitor, uh, what you can see here is that uh, under 2% um, oxygen, unlike when, uh, when I did not treat with AKT inhibitor, uh, more um, hair follicle stem cells um, the, did not produce, they, they maintained the same similar level. Um, however, what was interesting was that under 2% oxygen without AKT inhibitor, um, we were able to produce a lot more hair follicle stem cells. However, when I treat them with AKT inhibitor, the level of hair follicle stem cells produced was decreased. So this confirmed that the that um, mTOR2 downstream of AK2 is AKT signaling. Um, that can potentially regulate glutaminolysis and in the end um, play a role in the conversion of uh, hair follicle stem cell faith or maintaining the hair follicle stem cells faith. Now, since glutamine to glutamate conversion is very important through glutamine, uh, glutaminase uh, enzyme that's called GLS, I looked into the level of GLS in the case of 20% um, cultured cell and 2% cultured cells uh, treated with or without AKT inhibitor. And you can see that when um, cells were cultured in 2% oxygen, this is when more hair follicle stem cells are produced, GLS expression was decreased. However, when I treated cells with AKT inhibitor, um, with that led to increased level of progenitor cells. As you can see here, the jump from here to here, uh, you can see that GLS expression was increased. So this indicates that perhaps um, GLS may be uh, playing a role in main, um, changing hair follicle stem cells into progenitor cells. Um, here, I looked at GLS expression also again with the Richter knockout mice. And again, for control 2% oxygen level, where I saw a lot of hair follicle stem cells being produced, GLS expression was decreased. But in the case of Victorian knockout cells, where progenitor cells were unable to convert into hair follicle stem cells, GLS expression was highly upregulated. So it seems like mTOR2 AKT signaling modulates uh, glutaminase expression. So uh, I'd like to pause here and also uh, bring you to uh, another um, summary. So, so far, we talked about how mTOR2 activates AKT that would inhibit glutaminase. And this glutaminase is important for progenitor cells to um, convert their faith into hair follicle stem cells. In the case of Richter knockout mice, there is no mTOR2, so there's no AKT, so that there's an upregulation of glutaminase and so progenitor cells um, cannot uh, change their faith into hair follicle stem cells. And 
since glutaminase seems to be the most important, what I did here was under Richter to knock out my uh, cells organoid, I treated um, B cells with CB839, which is glutaminase inhibitor. And this was very um, interesting. And also, it was very surprising to find that without glutaminase inhibitor, Richter knockout mice are unable to produce hair follicle stem cells. But when I did inhibit glutaminase through this chemical, I was able to rescue um, the level of hair follicle stem cells comparable to control. And even in uh, under control cells, when glutamine glutaminase was inhibited, for even more cells uh, were able to convert their faith into hair follicle stem cells. So yes, yeah, so using the ex vivo organoid model, I um, demonstrated that mTOR2 activates AKT that would inhibit glutaminase. And progenitor cells that are mostly in ORS outer root sheet, um, for them, a subset of B cells to convert back into hair follicle stem cells, um, they would require glutaminolysis inhibition through decreased level or, uh, or decreased expression of glutaminase. Now, the next question I wanted to ask was, is the longevity of hair follicle stem cells impacted by mTOR2? Since like I said in the introduction, throughout our lifetime, we go through hair cycle. So ORS needs to convert their faith back into hair follicle stem cells and uh, to provide a reservoir. And when the next cue comes, new hair grows. And when the cue uh, is end, when the cue en ends, then the subset of progenitor cells will com convert that back into hair follicle stem cells. So this process needs to take place throughout our lifetime. Um, but if glutaminolysis um, inhibition takes place because of Richter to knockout, um, would this um, activity or the faith change be impacted? That was the question that I wanted to answer. Um, so here, I wanted to uh, draw your attention to the morphology. Um, so during the telogen phase, uh, you can see that the bulge is nicely resting here. And during anagen phase, that's the growth phase, you can see that the ORS cells uh, expand and make new hair and that grows downward. And during the catagen phase, um, these ORS cells would uh, degrade and part of this um, ORS, ORS cells would go back into bulge, convert their faith back into hair follicle stem cells. And for each round of hair, hair cycle, you would see an old bulge and the new bulge here. So what I did was throughout the um, each hair cycle, I carefully monitor um, the morphology using HNE staining. And it seems like loss of mTOR2 leads to dysfunctional hair cycle. There was a delay in activation of anagen. So you can see here that at P34, mouse should go into anagen phase to grow hair. But when there was no mTOR2, a Richter knockout, um, in, in Richter knockout cells, um, the anagen phase entered in much later at P53, P52. And also when you look at the morphology very carefully, this is a control h &E where you can clearly see the old bulge and new bulge, old bulge and new bulge. So you see two bulges for, for the most cases. However, um, when you don't have Rictor, um, you would, I would typically see only, only one bulge, single bulge. So it seems like the bulge is not being well maintained. So here's the quantification where under um, Rictor knockout uh, mice, you, I would see much less hair follicles with two bulges. So I told you that uh, during the growth phase, stem cells get activated and it goes into quiescent phase during resting phase. And progenitor cells during the growth phase uh, goes into differentiation. And during some time between regression um, going into rest, their faith would revert back into hair follicle stem cells. So I wanted to exactly trace this faith conversion. In order to do that, I utilize BRDU. We know that when stem cells get activated, they would, they would become proliferative. So I can trace um, 
the stem cells by injecting BRDU, as you can see here, all the ORS cells, the uh, green is the BRDU, is all marked that's uh, proliferating and growing during an, an antigen phase. And now when I leave them after injection of BRDU, um, for them to go through the hair cycle and collect the samples during telogen phase, during the resting phase, I can count how many of this green labeled cells um, went back into bulge area. And you can see immediately that much less cells, uh, green cells uh, went back into the bulge. And this is a quantification where BL, uh, BRDU positive cells per bulge were decreased in the case of um, Victoria knockout mice. And to confirm that mTOR2 AKT access is required for progenitor to hair follicle cells faith reversibility, I uh, performed some um, immunofluorescent um, staining on tissues. So here you can see that there's um, old bulge and here's a new bulge um, forming um, during antigen. And you can see that AKT um, signaling is very upregulated during antigen phase um, in ORS cells. And what is important to note here is that um, this AKT activation is not usually observed um, when Rictor is knocked out. And here you can see that even during the catagen phase, AKT signaling still, still remains in a few of the cells. But here again, in Rictor knockout myself, um, I would not see AKT signaling to that level. Um, and here again, for a telogen phase, um, this AKT level um, would die down and produce um, bu two bulges uh, marked with CD34, and you only see one bulge uh, that's marked with CD34 in Victor knockout mice. So what I wanted to do here was, uh, since glutaminase is important in the uh, process of changing hair follicle stem cell phase, um, what if I were to inject glutaminase inhibitor into um, Victoria knockout mice? Um, so I injected um, BPTS, that's the um, drug that I use to inhibit glutamin glutaminase in vivo, and um, when I injected BPTS into, uh, into Victor uh, knockout mice, I was able to rescue the phenotype where I was able to see two bulges now instead of one um, with DMSO control. And this is a quantification that there was increased level of hair follicle um, with two bulges when treated with glutaminase inhibitor. And I wanted to look at this in more of a long-term uh, maintenance. So here, this is a 20 months old, which is not really old um, because 20 months, mice can live much longer than um, 20 months. So this is not considered very old, but even at this stage, I started to see hair loss. Um, and, and when I looked at the hair follicle level um, in the case of Victor knockout mice, the level of hair follicles um, were decreased, um, as you can see in this quantification graph. And I took um, the tissue of these two mice and looked at uh, whether or not the level of CD34 is also decreased. And that was exactly the case, as you can see here. Um, when you look at the Rictor mice um, and at 20 months old, much less uh, CD34 signal was detected, and this is the quantification. Not only the uh, you can see, not only you can see through the fluorescence level, but I when I counted CD34 positive cells per hair follicles, I was able to see that um, there were less CD34 positive cells hair follicle stem cells um, when Rictor was knocked out. So I'd like to um, summarize my um, stories um, that I shared so far. So it seems like that hair follicle stem cell niche is hypoxic. Um, this I showed, I, I didn't show here in my talk, but um, I stained the tissue with hypoxia probe and I was able to show that hair follicle niche is hypoxic. And perhaps that's why low oxygen tension um, promotes hair follicle stem cells. 
And I also showed that hair follicle stem cells are metabolically flexible while progenitor cells require glutaminolysis. And this progenitor cells um, conversion to um, hair follicle stem cells requires MTOR2 AKT driven attenuation of glutamine metabolism. And MTOR2 uh, deletion impairs niche of regeneration by progenitors triggering a hair follicle stem cells exhaustion. So as you can see here in the schematics, stem cells becomes progenitors during growth phase and progenitor cells goes back into stem cells to um, provide reservoir of stem cells. And you can see here that um, the oxygen level is um, lower compared to um, the lower part of the um, hair follicle, growing hair follicle, where a lot of um, ORS cells reside. And when this uh, ORS cells want to go back into bulge and change their faith into hair follicle stem cells, mTOR2, uh, mTOR2 complex activates AKT, blocks glutaminolysis, and decreases glutamin glut glutaminolysis driven oxfos. And that in, in that way, in the new niche, uh, part of ORS cells becomes hair follicle stem cells. And this is how um, stem cells are maintained throughout uh, the lifetime. Now, the next question um, that arise from the study is the link between metabolism and chromatin architecture. I think this is a very good question to follow up because we know that stem cells, um, in stem cells, chromatin architecture, architecture is very open. Um, whereas when cells are going into differentiation pathway, chromatin architecture is more closed and perhaps metabolism can play a role or even regulate this chromatin architecture. And also the other um, question that would be very interesting to follow up uh, with this study is the link between translation of capacity and met metabolic regulation of hair follicle stem cell phase determination. Um, this is primarily because, um, yes, the gene expression uh, at the genetic level is important, but in the end, it's the translation and that's very important to produce new, uh, diff new proteins that's specific for differentiation, differentiating lineage uh, pathway. So it will be very interesting to look at how metabolic regulation ties into translational capacity. So um, with that, I would like to acknowledge some of the some of the people who helped with my project. So this project was um, performed when I was in Germany with um, Max, Planck in Max Planck Institute for um, Biolog uh, Biology for Aging with Wickstrom Lab. Um, so I think my um, previous PI, Sarah Wickstrom, for the guidance, um, and Emming Lab from University of Cologne uh, for providing uh, Victor knockout mice and um, some of the core um, facilities at Max Planck, uh, Fax and Imaging Core, and Metabolomics Core. Uh, help, they helped a lot with um, Fax analysis and LCMS analysis. Currently, I am at um, Digist um, Integu um, with Chang Lab. Um, I am continuing with ep uh, epithelial tissue stem cell uh, research here. And um, I would like to thank my current PI, Yang Te Zhang, um, for the current guidance and for supporting me so far. And with that, I would like to answer any questions. <laughs>